What's happening, family? It is your man, CRB Jr. here at Motown Mafia Podcast. Of course, the Big Boss Filmworks production. To my left is my brother and partner in crime, Big Lou. How you feeling, man? I'm good, man. I'm good, 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 good. Um, let me see, man. Well, let's we'll retract. We'll, but um, just we're in the Bahamas, first time, right? Beautiful beautiful visit man i mean a lot of work done a lot of sightseeing a lot of friends made the bahamas was on point that that was that was truly the shit okay so if you guys haven't checked out the content it's episode it's pod 64 we shot it live in the bahamas uh we got a chance to catch up with a guy who we're really going to do some more chronicling because the more we research this story of course we're talking about basil miller he's the big whale out of the bahamas that what my up, dad was doing basil. this Shout out to Basil the Third. Shout out to Basil Jr. Shout out to the whole Miller family down there in the islands. Um, the more we get into his story, the bigger the story gets, the more remarkable this man's yeah. life and times was. Yeah. Um, so, and the hospitality that, that they showed us down there was much appreciated. But um, so you guys are going to get a chance to see some really once and once never spoke about stuff uh, in the Motown Mafia 2 remix un, uh, Motown Mafia Reloaded um, we're getting the band back together again so this will be directed by the world famous critically acclaimed Alan Bradley known to the public as Al Prophet the prophetic one the prophetic one yup 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 for real for real for real so we're excited about that so we were down in the Bahamas shooting some of that stuff and um we're down in South Florida and we caught up with uh, Eddie Baby shout out to Eddie Baby and um you know we're gonna bring in a lot more people um for this project, it's it's gonna cover like the '80s when Pop and Eddie got out of jail, and all of the events from the '80s, and then actually going into the '90s. And I think we're gonna run it all the way as best we can. Um, it's still in the early phases of production, and you know how this thing works. Yeah. You guys who don't know, um, the editing floor ends up with more stuff than the actual <laughs> screen does. Absolutely, but. Um, we, we, we know it's going to be hot because the, the content matter is awesome and um, we're going to bring in some of the other people from the family here in the D. And um, with that, speaking about other family here in the D, shout out to the big homie KK. Uh, once again, he's got a great book out. Yes, yes, yes. If, yes, these, if bri these bricks could talk. If these bricks could talk. Um, so sh look for him and we'll put a, a link in our description because I think he, he's doing it through his IG page. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I put up a link uh, uh, by the time this airs on. Uh, yeah, and uh, more uh, people who I don't. They'll definitely be participating with us on the pod, and maybe even in the Motown Mafia Two, Motown Mafia Reloaded. Mm -hmm. um, we had bumped into uh, the homegirl Big Fifty um, at the book fair last month, or actually, yeah, last month. That yeah, was, it was June, last month. Last month, um, her book out of Hood Tale. A beyond BT with Big Fifty. Um, you guys haven't checked her out on Chat Queens or any of the bar, but we spoke to the sister. She's um, she'll be on the pod within the month. Um, and about two months ago, we had bumped into Edie Boyd, the founder of the Fifty Boys, the first guy who put Meech on. He really taught Meech and T. Um, we caught up to him at Sting at, uh, yeah. at Al's party. Yeah, at the, and, Al's, uh, Al's we'll party. We'll be reaching out to him. So we got a lot of hot interviews and things coming up. And the cool thing about when you do these kind of things like we're doing with the doc is um, it gives a real good reason to get the family all back together, grin, and bring some shine to um, the street history of Detroit in a town like Detroit where street history and actual city history all get married together. Yeah, it's a rich, rich... Uh Rich history of uh, crime in our city. So you got some conch fish? I had the conch fish, dude. <laughs> Man. Oh, God, yeah. I, I, I couldn't have imagined it like that. I mean, I've seen it on TV. And, and, and to actually see it, and you guys will see some of the footage that I recorded and and captured, but uh, the Bahamas, the Bahamas is bad, man. Yeah, yeah, that, it was a good time. We're looking for. We're gonna have to go back down there, um, because uh, we're really, I think, of the opinion that uh, Basil's story needs to be a full project. 
Oh, it, it's so much to it. And we're going to touch on a little bit more in this episode. And this is episode 65 of the Motown Mafia podcast. Again, a Big Boss Filmworks production. Uh, please hit the like, share, and subscribe. I suspect we're going through some type of shadow banning and all. So yeah. uh, I don't know what we've done to upset the good people. But we're, we're, we're going to keep it plugging along. So please, if you're out there, hit the like, share, and subscribe button. It really helps with the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. And I've been on a big up to ABC, a better concept studios, where we were filming uh, Motown Mafia. We were filming some scenes and some interviews for Motown Mafia, too. Big up to them. Big shout out to Karen. Yeah, the hospitality that the sisters, um, you know, there's there's unseen um, rewards and pay that comes from doing the kind of work we do. Yeah. Um, and that was one of them when you get a chance to do business with other black entrepreneurs. Yes. And, and all the stereotypes and myths and misinformation that we can't work together and that we're always hating on each other when you see that sister way Karen and them just opened up their studio to us I mean right and was just like whatever we can do to help yeah you yeah. know now the flip side we didn't come there with a with our hand out in a hat because business is business business is business but um just yeah just really a class act what those ladies are doing down there absolutely um, absolutely so in fact we need to we'll need to put it in the description because if you guys are in south florida if you're doing content and you're in your basement or you're in the office and you're looking for a more professional setting um if you do if you're in the music they got a music studio inside oh, their man. facility they got all the bells and whistles it's a ready-to-go kind of situation. The DJ and me just just lost my mind up in there. I thought about my days as a DJ to have a resource. I didn't get out enough. I didn't get out enough back in them days, man. Yeah. Oh gosh, it was beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, you know, uh, part of my life plan is relocating to uh, South Florida. So I was like, uh, Karen, is it too early to put up the Big Boss posters yet? I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Oh, but yeah. um, no, that's cool, and we definitely will do. And that's the name of the of our company, right? ABC. Studios? ABC, a better concept studios. Okay. In Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale, yeah. Yeah, yeah. look them up. Look, look them, them up, up and we'll, we'll we will provide a link for them. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a character in this genre that um, we've been looking to cover and, and talk about. Um, he's an absolute legend, you know, and I. Despite of some of our commenters who always say, why do we glorify certain figures, you know, our, whether it's my dad or Eddie Jackson or Frank Matthews or any of these kind of people, we're not attempting to go, we're just attempting to chronicle people who have led some exceptional lives regardless of what they did for their, to get their money and their impacts on their community. And it's up to you guys out there to, you know, to be the judge, the jury, or the executioner, whether they did more good or more bad. But what can't be disputed is the impact they had on their communities. And in our case, that's the community of Detroit. And in this guy's case, uh, Harlem. And I don't think it's an understatement to say, um, I'm like, what's that feedback? Is that the radio over there or something? What do you hear? Anyway. Yeah. Um, not radios, no. Not um, sure. Did they impact their community? So the man that we're speaking about is a man that goes by the name of Pee Wee Kirkland, born Richard Kirk Kirkland. Um, you know, everybody's kind of heard of the guy. I mean, he's been featured in Don Diva, uh, Feds Magazine, mm -hmm. um, just an absolute legend. But there are a couple little anecdotes in this story. and. We, his story is definitely not one that you can cover in one segment of a pod. So I'm throwing it out there for people who are into this kind of thing. If you're not familiar with this guy's character and his events. And just as a black man, as a black businessman that really likes to give credit when you see a brother with business acumen, regardless of whether he's on Wall Street or on the block, when you see that kind of business acumen, that it be pointed out. Mm -hmm. So... Pee Wee Kirkland, according to him now, started his life of crime very early, 13, 14. Okay. Right? With the regular shit, still in bicycles, still in this, still in that. You know, very typical, of course, we were talking about still the, the late remnants of Jim Crow and segregation, mm -hmm. even in a place like New York City, right? Um, very quickly, unlike most hoodlums, which again shows uh, young hoodlums, 
unlike most, he had a little bigger ambition. So he started going down to the jewelry district of New York, stealing jewelry. Okay. And the legend goes that on one of his snatching grabs, and, and that this let me be fair to it and just not make him out, because not only did he start stealing jewelry, it led to him actually becoming a de facto jeweler, because he, he as he was stealing so much jewelry, he took the time to actually learn about clarity and cuts of diamonds. Okay. So because, as anybody who's been out here in the world, you know, I've been there. I've been at the spot and people come with a ring that's worth $10,000, but they don't know whether it's real or fake. Okay. Guy working the door at the spot be like, man, I give you $20 for it. I don't even know if this shit is real. Next thing you know, they're taking the shit to the jeweler in the morning. Jeweler puts the scope on. It's like, oh man, this is a hell of a stone you got here. And just because somebody didn't know, they just sold something that was worth twenty thousand for twenty dollars, and vice happens. versa. Somebody come and say, "Man, this ring worth twenty thousand dollars. This is a bad piece. Look at how it's shining." And somebody working the spot don't know no better. And like, what you want for it? Then give me two thousand dollars. And then only to find out he just bought some cracker jack yeah, right. box pot right. of jewelry that shit is costume and it's worth if it get anywhere near moisture it's gonna turn green <laughs> not only can you not take a shower in it nigga, you better not run no water by it <laughs> and it's gonna um but mr Pee Wee kirkland did not suffer that fate because he took the time to become an expert on jewelry because he was an ascending jewelry thief right mm -hmm. and as the legend goes he made a big score and this is, we're talking about this, Pee -wee, this point in Pee Wee's criminal career is the mid 60s. Okay. So you're talking about over 50 some odd years ago. Mm -hmm. So that said, because supposedly he stole about $300,000 worth of jewelry. 300,000, 1965, 66 money. So. I know sometimes audience, but there's a, there's a thing called inflation. That's why gas this year is five dollars, four dollars a gallon, and three years ago gas was two fifty a gallon. Right? Same, your know, same five dollars only buy you half as much gas as it did just two years ago. Well, in Pee Wee's day, gas was fifty cent a gallon. Mm -hmm. See, money was worth a lot more. So when we do these kind of calculations, what we're saying is that that three hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry that Pee Wee's got. Mm -hmm. was in today's money like three million. Three million, all right. Really a little bit more. Let's just say a 10 to 1. The money's worth 10 times more. Money was worth 10 times more back then than it is worth now. Correct. Right? So, him being again an enterprising young man who's learned his way around the streets a little bit, he knows some Italian gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Oh, this, they're gonna be the fence. He takes the 300K worth of jewelry to the mob the mob being the mob, like, okay, we abide, but we ain't gonna give you no bread. Okay. But you will live up in Harlem, and already by this time, the, the, the Vietnam War influx of soldiers with drug problems was coming, and the, the, uh, the beatnik hippies was already getting high, and Harlem was already starting to, and if you guys follow the show on Epic, um, Godfather Harlem, great show with Forrest, awesome Whitt show. Forrest Whitaker playing Bumpy Johnson. It depicts that era. So, again, Pee Wee, Her Pee -wee Kirkland did not start the heroin business in Harlem. The, that existed. He lived in that world, and he's a product of that environment. Long story short, though, he takes the money, he takes the jury to the mob. Mob checks it out. It's real. Which they agree on the number. 300,000 is the number they agree on. Thing is, the mob is like, well, we ain't gonna give you 300,000 in cash, but we give you 300,000 in work. You just take it back to Harlem, turn it into cash. Um, reminds me of a lot. Uh, you ever seen Are you talking about Lord of War? Lord of War, right? Diversify? The ver diversify, right? Absolutely. You guys don't know what we're talking about. There's a movie with a guy <laughs> named Nicolas Cage who plays. It's a true character. Um, actually, He's the guy that they cover in Lord of War. The basketball player, Brittany Grimer, who was a detainee yeah, yeah. in Russia. Okay, yeah. The prisoner. That's the, him? That was his Russian counterpart. Oh. i show you how history okay. goes full circle. That's who they traded her for, was his Russian counterpart. Whoa. Um, 
But anyway, this character played by Nicolas Cage is a big time arms dealer. And he goes to make this deal with uh, these Colombian drug lords. And he brings all of them all the guns they wanted. And he's like, okay, where's my money? And instead of giving them money, they give him a suitcase full of bricks of yay. Bricks of yay. And he's like, what am I supposed to do with this? And the Colombian's like, diversify. <laughs> like, this shit is money. Trust me. Take this shit it's currency and turn it into money, right? That was, yeah, definitely. Same kind of exact situation. So the mob tells Pee Wee, look, man, we're not giving you cash, but this work we got is A1. You're a smart kid. Mm -hmm. You take mm -hmm. this product back, you'll figure it out. Okay. He takes the $300,000 worth of jive back to Harlem. Street legend has it, he turned that into 900000 Now, again, that's 900000 late 60s money. And he's like 16 years old. That's like nine million dollars today's money, right? That would lead to him becoming what he his nickname was, the Bank of Harlem. That the countless numbers, not in the hundreds, but in the thousands of rents he paid, mm -hmm. tuitions he paid, mm -hmm. um, businesses in Harlem that he would go on to fund. Because Pee Wee's thing was again showing that he was not your typical dope man, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. He didn't really want to do that. So, but he knows the game. He's got the capital now after he stings him with this nine hundred thousand dollar lick. So he knows he's from Harlem. He's respected. He's got a reputation. He knows who can move the bag. He's right. looking for work, and then he dealt with the Italians who got the work. Right on. So he became the guy that Lou, I'm a Lou Pee Wee, I'm XYZ hustler and hauler. Man, if I had a hundred thousand, I could get the right work. I could make some money. Okay, man. Give me. I'm gonna give you this hundred thousand. But in ninety days, thirty days, I need you to give me back hundred and fifty thousand. But you should be able to do that because off of that hundred thousand you invest, you're gonna make about a million. Mm -hmm. So paying me back an extra fifty thousand for the finance right. shouldn't be that, no that big. That should be light work. That should be real light work. Mm -hmm. Well, this was kind of Pee Wee's business model. So let's just do some simple calculations because we'll get to. No one really knows how much money this man made. Mm -hmm. If you got ten guys that you're funding their their bag, and you're getting fifty thousand dollars a month off of your finance fee. You give them no hundred thousand dollars, they gotta pay you back a hundred and fifty thousand. Well, fifty thousand times ten cats is five hundred thousand. All day, every day. Right? Yeah. Now if you got twenty, just do the math. And if you're doing bigger deals, if you're funding people say a million dollars and they gotta pay you back a million five, mm -hmm. who knows? Well some people said they do know. The Financial Times, the Financial Times is a magazine out of England that deals with all the global Wall Street commodity stuff. The Financial Times in the late 60s did a review of Pee Wee Kirkland. Now this ain't, this is, this is no, the this white folks, Don white Dee, folks. <laughs> this ain't what, right, this is all respect, shout out to the big homie Kevin Childs. Uh, and this ain't what Don Diva say. Right. Uh, shout out to the people at Feds and Anton and them. Right, exactly. This ain't what Feds Andy say. Is. This ain't what none of them say. This is what the white folks who in charge of the white folks say. Nah. The white folks in charge of the white folks at the Financial Times. And you got to know how much noise a man like this has to be making for a publication like the Financial Times even to know he exists. Right. I'm making some serious noise. Right, dear. They don't cover hood stories. Right. The Financial Times said the man was worth $33 million dollars. In the late 60s. That's 33 million times 10, 10 to 1 ratio again from that money back in the day, that's about 330 million. Right. Most all people who know of Pee Wee and were close to him say that that 33 million is a light count. I believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very much like 
all of them, and I'm about to say this, and please don't put in the comment, don't compare Eddie Jackson to Pee Wee Kirkland. I'm not trying to compare Eddie Jackson to Pee Wee Kirkland. I'm just comparing two street legends that both I take to be true because they're documented. It was said that Pee Wee had over 100 cars, a mixture of Rolls Royces, Cadillacs, Lamborghinis, Jaguars at one time. And of course, those in Detroit know the legend of Eddie Jackson having 100 Cadillacs on the street at one time. Um, it just makes you really think when I listen at the amount, that golden era, that late 60s, early 70s. Um, it's unfortunate the amount of money that went through our community and what could have been done with it. But in fairness to all those guys, you know, Pee Wee, they ask him about that and about how much money he really had. He says, you know, when you got that much money, all you know is I got more money than I could ever spend. So why not give it to people who I can help? Why not give it to my friends? Why not give it to my families? Because I bought all the fur coats. I bought all the Rolls Royce. They talk about Pee Wee was 16 driving Corniche Rolls Royces in the 60s. We ain't talking about like what Eddie and Frank 16 Matthew. Years old. He's 16 years old in the 60s in, Cor in Corniche Rolls Royces. Ooh. Dude. Different level kind of shit. This different level. Yeah. And you were telling me that uh, he had crossed paths with uh, the the infamous Frank Matthews. The infamous Frank Matthews and Frank Lucas. So, right, he has two great stories about, oh, those, wow. about those guys. Okay. Um, first, when they ask him in the interview, um, so please go online. We're not hating. Go online. Um, I, I went down the rabbit hole of really researching this guy. I've read the Fame Fed magazine interview of him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that was a great story. But then I went and all kind of stuff on YouTube about about this guy. Right on. Um, so the guy who was interviewing him in this one, I think, is actually the Vice. I'm not sure if it's Vice or Vlad. One of Shout out to uh, the homeboy Cavario and the work he's doing over there on Vlad, too. Uh, look forward to him being in town. I think he's going to be in town very soon. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, oh, definitely. We need to catch up. He might be in town now. We need to reach out to him. Anyway, um, he has a story about Frank Lucas and the guy, and he's just, he's keeping it real. He's like, well, you know, Frank Lucas was here, and I was way up here, so I didn't really deal with But someone related to him did cross paths with Frank Lucas and his country boys family organization. Okay. And I'm not throwing shade on him. That's what Frank Lucas's crew was known I as. I remember that. The country, the country boys. boys. The yeah. country boys. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway... The friend of Pee Wee Kirkland's, or family member of Pee Wee Kirkland's, got into some financial difficulties, however, because people who are related to rich people still do silly shit. Mm -hmm. Lord knows that we can attest to it. And you always ask yourself, like, why didn't you just come to me for the money instead of doing that dumb shit? But people do that shit. Anyway, somebody close to Pee Wee had got into debt with Frank Lucas's people. Okay. And Frank Lucas's people scoop them up, and they about to, I guess, put hands and feet on them about this tab. Okay. Frank Lucas ends up on the scene and like what's going down here and his people explain to him, man, this nigga owe us money and we about to show him that you can't owe us money. Okay. And the guy who's about to be assaulted say, you know I'm Pee Wee Kirkland's family. And when he says this, Frank Lucas looks at the rest of his crew and is like, hold on, man. Let that man go. Matter of fact, as the legend goes, Frank Lucas goes in his pocket, hands old boy a couple thousand, and tell me, you make sure you tell Pee Wee, there ain't no power. Ain't, ain't we, like didn't, we didn't know that you was y'all was can. Matter of fact, the hell with what you owe us. Here, you take a couple more thousand, and if you need some more help, because I don't want no problems. So that's just a, another antidote to kind of the level mm -hmm. of respect that uh, Pee Wee Kirkland had. And then the other one I think that you're referring yeah, yeah. to is about Frank Matthews. Matthews, yeah, right? yeah. So as legend goes, Frank Matthews had gave another famous New York hustler, uh, Leroy Nicky Barnes, some work. And, and Nicky owed him about 300000 Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, niggas do one, niggas do. Nicky ain't paid the man his money from. Right. So Frank Matthews don't want this shit to spill all out of control, but he would like to get paid now, those who follow Frank Matthews, this is a guy that has stories, first-hand accounts. He's given friends a million, a million dollars and forgot that he gave it to them kind of shit. Yeah. But he's like, in this case, he like, Nicky need to pay me with this money he owed me. 
So I guess he tired of asking Nikki about his money, or he ain't the kind of nigga to like asking. Like, well, I gotta ask you about my money. You know you owe me the money. Yes, Baby, my money. You know, right? You know who you owe. Mm-hmm. So he see Pee Wee, and he like Pee Wee man. Will you talk to your man Nikki man? Tell him to run me that three hundred thousand that he owe me. And Pee Wee like, well, it ain't really my business, Frank. But I'll, I'll talk to the nigga for you. So he catch up to Nikki Barnes, and he tell Nikki, he say, man, nah, I didn't. I ran in the pe- I ran into Frank Matthews, man. And he asked me to straighten out this little thing y'all got going with this three hundred man. Now is you gonna pay the man? And he said, Nikki went told, I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay the man. People 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 no, people people ain't like that. I'm gonna pay the man. And he's like, uh, well when you gonna pay the man, Nikki? I'm gonna pay him next week. I'm gonna pay him next week. Tell him I'm gonna pay him next week. The people ain't gonna be no problems. I'm gonna pay the man, I'm gonna pay the man. And uh true to his word, next week, he paid the man. Man, words were solid, baby. Words were solid, and again, the fact that when a man like Pee Wee Kirkland is acting as the moderator, right? That both very large guys in that world say, you know, if we bring Pee Wee in, everybody know he ain't he ain't the one. If he involves himself in this situation, we should we all got to make this we right. should make this right, <laughs> right? Because exactly. if it gets made wrong, it could end up real wrong, and that ain't what nobody is trying is trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, parallel to this, the guy is like supposedly one of the greatest basketball players ever to come out of New York, and anyone knows anything about New York? Yeah. It's got a rich basketball history. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, his his feats at the um, Rucker basketball tournament, he's really one of the guys who put the Rucker tournament on the map. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't get a scholarship to a Division One school because he pulled up at the campus during a recruiting trip or something like in a Rolls Royce and the president of the school was like, I'm not giving this young black guy a scholarship and he's driving Rolls Royce. Oh, right. So he ends up going to a Division three school which he set all kind of records. Um, he actually was drafted by the Chicago Bulls. They offered him a $40,000 contract. He turns it down because he's saying that would be a pay cut. Getting that work. All right. And it is in, in the interview that I saw, in fact, he says, you know, $40,000 to me at that time was gambling money. That wasn't no money. Now again, this is coming from a guy who at 16 then already hit a $900,000 lick. Right. So now he's 19, 18, 19, and somebody's offering him $40,000 to play basketball. Which is basically $500,000. Which still, you know, I mean, you never know what would happen because people put him, say he was as good as a guy back in the day named Tiny Nate Tiny Archibald, was regarded as the best point guard in basketball at the time. And, mm-hmm. um, Anyway, the fast forward, when Pee Wee ends up catching a case, um, he ends up catching this case like in 19, in the early 71, because yeah, he caught his case even before Frank Matthews' situation in New York or Eddie Jackson's situation or much later, Nicky Barnes. So he catches his first case in um, 71, and they send him to Lewisburg. Okay. Let me check this. Uh, All right. He's playing in the prison league in Lu- in Lewisburg, right? He averages a hundred points a game. Now you say this ain't pro ball or nothing, but anybody's ever been to jail, you know, there's a lot of talented basketball players in there. Mm-hmm. He's averaging a hundred points a game in the um, in the prison league. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the fact that no one, um, in fact, is a Hall of Famer by the name of Connie Hawkins, who's another New Yorker who played with everyone who played with him, there's like no doubt or dispute that he was not only good enough to go pro, but good enough to have been a great pro. Mm-hmm. Um, but a victim of his circumstances. And, and if you listen to the man, um, I sh- shouldn't even use the word victim because he, he takes full accountability for what he did. Okay. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why he said that there's never been a real project that he's participated on about his life is that they don't want the good, the bad, and the ugly. They want either all the bad or they want all the good. And he's like, there's a lot of crying and suffering and heartache that comes in my story along with all the over-the-top money and the chinchilla coats and the... $200,000 Lynx coats and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Um, but anyway, he ends up doing that. He, he does his time on his first case from 71, gets back out. The feds are all over him because they never get any of his vast wealth. They hit him again with a net worth income tax case, which is the same case they got Al Capone on. They could never get him on a drug conspiracy again or anything else, so they hit him with a net worth case. As the feds will do, threaten to put his mom in jail. He decided that before he let his mom do a day, he'd just take the cop. Mm -hmm. He does another 10. Comes home in like 87, 88. Sees that the game has changed. The world has changed and he's a different man. Anyway, he spent the last 20 years as a motivational speaker helping youth. Mm -hmm. Advising them to stay um, out of the game. That the days of his day are gone and done and that there's other ways to, to make a living and to live the good life. Sounds familiar. So, <laughs> yes. Um, and just a real story of redemption. Um, works with the school kids all over the country. Um, it's recognized as a great motivational speaker and, and all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, one of the early street legends to really start getting shout outs, whether it's Pusha T or... Um, Young Dolph. Young Dolph. Many people. Yeah. Uh, many people have uh, referred to Pee Wee Kirkland in their lyrics. Oh, no um, question. No question. So, um, so yeah, man, family. Um, guys are not familiar with him. Maybe some of the younger people out there. Take the time, if you like, following and chronicling these kind of characters that impact on our community. Damn straight need to be talking about Pee Wee Kirkland. Um, he's definitely on our short list as we go about networking and trying to do some of the things we're doing as we take the other part of our business, not the podcast part, but the movie business and documentary business um, to the next level. He's one of the kind of characters I'd love to really do something with. He's yeah. still living. Um, you know, just a phenomenal story. So, yeah. shout out to Pee Wee Kirkland and, uh, up, sir. And, and all of the above. You know, um, we got a couple of uh, we got a couple of commenters in the uh, in the live here. We got Willie Trust and God Stevenson's big up. Did not forget you. He wants to know when is the next event that we are having in Detroit or being a part of the next event. Um, Yet to be identified, I want to say in November, because we we are roughly anticipating that we'll be launching a premiere, doing some premiere parties for Motown, Motown Life Mafia Mafia Part 2, two Reloaded, mm -hmm. around the Thanksgiving time. I'm sure, uh, just stay in touch with us and we got your info, yeah. um, we'll be doing something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, we know we got our home girl. Uh, Michelle, who just pr finished her movie Sloppy Seconds, so Sloppy shout out, Second, shout out to her and shout out to Plush Promotions, uh, Lisa Brown uh -huh. and them over there, and shout out to our other home girl, um, Tanja, the shoe lady. She's got some great stuff over on Tubi. Yes. Shout out to um, old boy over at um, Dennis and what he's doing too, and. Um, but Homegirl Michelle and Sloppy Seconds, I think they'll be doing their premiere maybe next month or early September. So I'm sure we'll do some kind of partnership or at yeah. bare minimum. Um, yeah, we'll definitely we'll, be we'll there. Definitely to, uh, be in being, the house. being there to help celebrate that. So um, yeah, so looking forward to that. And um, also, I think Time just got some other stuff coming out um, as we continue to try to build our networking opportunities here in the D with. These, we got some brothers and sisters here in the D that are doing some phenomenal things with the movie industry. Right. Um, I think for real, for real, that one day, 20 years from now, they're going to be writing. The, what, what, what these people in Detroit are doing now, they're going to be writing in business books and in film study classes. Some of the techniques that they've used to be able to work within budgets and get stories about our community out into the world. Yes. Um, yes. So the answer to that, my brother, is we don't have an exact date of the next thing, but stay tuned. And again, I know we'll, we'll be at uh, Sloppy Seconds premiere and uh, some of our other people in our network at some movie premieres coming up. But no doubt come November, tentatively now, we'll be doing some early before it goes to the streaming platforms. Uh, we'll probably 
do some private showings of Motown Mafia Part Two at a few different venues around town. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. so we look forward to you um, to coming to see us, family. So appreciate your support, though. And uh, Nikki Nicole just says, uh, CBJ, hi yo, my brother friend. What up, Vicky? <laughs> oh, man, it's good to see the fan. That's, again, um, the little perk of this business we do is um, we get a chance to, to catch up to old friends and yeah. and all of the above. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and it's it's a good thing. Um, guys, I'll see that. Was, uh, you got a chance. You've been hearing about Money Walt like for years, right? A, a, a man down in Florida. I met Money Walt. Uh, ten years before, did and, you? Yes, yes. Met Money Walt when you guys were. And if I have some video footage, I may put this up as a, a single deal. But you all were looking at a property down there, and that's uh, right. Yeah, I had met Walt ten years prior, and uh, didn't know him that well. Seemed affable, you no know, nice cat. You right. know what I'm saying? And then uh, you know to actually meet. Money Walt again ten years later and get to know Money Walt. He reminds me of, and I said this before, my my man, rest in peace, Puff the executive, Puffy. Okay. But yeah, he, I mean, not Puffy Combs, the not Detroit Puffy Puff. Combs. Detroit, anybody in Detroit knows who I'm talking about. Puff the executive, the big visor. Shout out to you, sir. Uh, seafood spot downtown. I'm um, not downtown. It's on the east side. Um. Uh, who else do we want to uh, leave a good shout out to? Yeah, but you got a chance to really hear from Walt firsthand what a conduit. Oh, Because no. you've heard that that piece that I did on, on at the barber shop. Uh, yeah, because without Walt, there's none of those stories about Eddie and the Big Head of New York. There's maybe no Cotillion no Club. No Cotillion Club. Mike Abstral Underwood, JB Smooth. Oh man. Uh without without Money Walt. Yeah, just Money Walt. And he gave a great interview on Motown Mafia Reloaded. Yeah, yeah. So you guys will get some clips of him. Uh we could not do some of the more salacious events that Walt has had opportunity. There was much editing done that day. A lot of editing done. So Wendy Williams, owe us some thanks. Tyra Banks, you owe us some thanks. You, you owe us some thanks. Yes, uh, Mary, yes. Miss Mary J. Blige, and all you fine sisters out there. Yes, you yes. owe us some thanks. Yes, yes. And a, we couple, and a couple of the uh, cats. It was a, it was a couple bits of spillage that I had to cut out. Uh, Brother Charlemagne and, and oh, Brother Charlemagne. Matter of fact. You luckily we're above uh, blackmail because we're supposed to be on the Breakfast Club <laughs> right now. That's right. We got some shit. <laughs> I'm just saying, Envy, <laughs> Angela. We know where the bones are buried. Charlemagne the God. <laughs> just saying, man. And I know we was all young at one time when we young. Uh, we'd be doing shit. Mariah. Mo uh, Mariah. Actually, that's on my bag because Mariah was. You know, we thought we was too important to talk to Mariah. Right. right. I was so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there's wrong, and then there's that kind of wrong. That's right. There's blowing it, and then there's, you say Mariah wanted to hang out with you guys at the Palladium, and you guys didn't let her in the VIP. Yeah. Yeah, that that would be us. That, that would be us. But the smallest of the world, right, there, Walt's frat brother, it's Gene Deal. Shout out to Gene Deal. He's got a great YouTube station going on. Um, and that Gene Deal then played basketball with KK. Oh, at, okay. Yeah, same okay. guy. Okay. Okay. Down in Alabama. Yeah. Yeah, just the smallness of the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's all connected. Thing. Right. And of course, Gene will be Puffy and Bad Boy security guard for years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, was right there with all that Bad Boy. He, he does oh. some. Oh, we got we got my man Ted Lagarde. What up, brother? Brother Ted Lagarde Vest, one of the premier um, animal athletic gear producers in the country. Shout out to brother Ted. Me and Ted also involved in some real estate deals together up in Oakland County. Um, remember me and Ted went over to China. I, I do recall that. Yes. And, yes. Um, so shout out to him. Um, you know, me and the Lagarde family go back 40 years plus. Shout out to Uncle Lenny. Um, shout out to the big homie. You know who you are. 
Yes. You know, um, always love, all the love and respect in the world, and um, and all that. So yeah, it's good. his question. Yeah. Any plans to put music to your project? If so, how do people submit music to Big Boss Filmworks? Um, well, Ted, as you know, as we spoke yesterday, and uh, your nephew, Little Tommy, I forget Tommy's music name. I and remember Little t Tommy. Yes. was down there when... Um, down at uh, Luke Doc Davis. Channel. We was at Doc Davis. I still show. got that footage. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to put some links to, to, to Tommy, so we want Tommy. But the long story short is shoot us an email to either BigBossFilmworks at gmail.com forward us your music or anything like that for big at big boss filmworks at yahoo.com or big boss filmworks at gmail.com that's right we definitely are in need of some soundtracks and on that we'll pass it along going back to our home girl michelle because michelle just reached out to us again they're in post-production of her movie sloppy seconds yeah that her and uh lisa did yeah. And uh, they're looking for some soundtracks. Well, I'm going to throw a couple of shouts out to some of my music massive. We got Nick Speed. Big up to you, Big bro. up to Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, big up to Nick Speed and uh, Ro Spit. They, they have a bit of a project, the Coney Island project, though. And then we got my man uh, DJ King David. He put his uh, his. I'm gonna have to get you a copy of his uh, CD or put it on a put it on the phone or something like that. It's called Good Dope Sells Itself. Facts. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Excellent release and uh, tons of Chino. Oh man, Chino, man. I you know I've been following. Shout out to cousin Jerry. You guys know him probably in the streets by his music. Chino, we were supposed to be getting together this week. Gonna get together. Um, Chino's killing the game, man. Chino's doing it, man. He's doing it. I'm so proud. I mean, this is my blood, blood cousin, not just a street cousin. Yeah. Uh, this is my blood. And to see, um, you know, and he'd been at it for a minute. Um, he always helped us out at Hall of Fame. and Always. Um, he's just, you know, every everything I see him drop now the, right. the, from, from the way he spits. In fact, that's Chino right on the cover of getting off zero mind right money right the success of both of them and my cousin right. Alyssa at the lip bar you know which is just blown, blown up blown up blown up but yeah family at its best that's Chino and cousin Melissa doing some uh, my like, like 2014 2014 exactly um so yeah, by the way, a great book for those looking for some inspiration. Mind right, money right, getting off zero. Uh, shout out to Ray Tatum down there in Atlanta. Big up, right? GOC family. Book is available at Amazon. And since we done went down that road, do not forget Big Man on Campus, a fictionalized version of my life during my college days. Names and places have been changed to protect the innocent as well as the guilty. Available on Kindle on Amazon. And then... How it's not here, I do not know. But of course, Big Boss Film War, um, <laughs> Motown Mafia, Memoirs of a Kingpin's Kid, available on Amazon at BigBossFilmWorks.com, um, everywhere. So, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. So, Ted, yeah, and um, we're going to link up. You know, Ted's got some, just a great entrepreneur and just a great guy oh no question so um yeah we yeah. know we we definitely gonna link up and see if we can get fam little tommy but yeah so homegirl michelle's looking for some all you um hip-hop artists uh we got a we got a teammate um michelle and her project they're looking like right now they're in uh post-production mm -hmm. so please get some music if you want somebody to listen to it they're looking for some things for their soundtrack we need the music for Motown Mafia Part 2 Motown Mafia Reloaded yeah. um, we got script work being done one script in the can another script that and, went and completed the process, right? that will probably end up going to screen before um, for a bunch of reasons that we're not going to go into right now but it definitely um it's like uh, we get, I can leak this part. It's an up-to-date version of this. So again, it will be a movie based on a true story. You know, it'll be dramatized, obviously, but definitely the events and characters that will be featured in it. Um, it's real. It's yeah. a real story. Um, and and so that's two things for sure. We're gonna need a movie for our first 
motion picture release and um, we're going to need music for the doc coming up. Correct. And, um, well, I think me and Cousin and Chino have been spoke about it now. We're going to we're gonna get y'all some nice new intro music for this podcast, too. So, please, yeah. BigBossFilmworks at gmail.com. BigBossFilmworks at yahoo.com. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, oh, one more shout out to my man, Billy. Uh, Billy, uh, the glass, bla- glass Block Express. Uh, my man Billy met him met him not too long ago over uh, down in Detroit, and uh, he's a big fan of the show. Just wanted to send a big, big shout out to him. All right, definitely Billy. Yeah, Billy knew about uh, Petey Weestraw and uh, yeah. Buck a Buck and that whole crew. And everybody and, thought he was Mike Epps. Yeah, yeah. Look, he do like uh, he look like uh, look like Mike Epps. Yeah, he do. Yeah, he do. Um, and so the thing is to go back, um, and we're not going to go into it now because we're going to cover a lot of it. Then the man that we went down to the Bahamas to get with his family, yeah, uh, Basil Miller. Um, when I was watching the Pee Wee Kirkland stuff, and the fact that the Financial Times covered him, and it made me think about when we came across that article that we got about. Former Secretary of State in the early seventies, Henry Kissinger, Kissinger, yeah, was involved in this whale situation down in the island of Basil Miller. So, it basically was a um, kidnapping. Is yeah. what they did. That's you know, right. and I had heard the legend through pops because, of course, my father and Basil would meet, which would lead to them working together. And you know, this was, of course, right at the time where I started working for pops, which is the story that we're going to unpack in Motown Mafia Part Two, Motown Mafia Reloaded. But we came across an article describing how um, in 1974, Basil had been indicted and had fled. Okay. Um, he moved himself and his family to Jamaica while this, when his legal problems initially began. And he was such a whale. Again, the Secretary of State normally does not know what Negroes are doing in, in the game. Yeah. They, you got to get way up on the food chain for the Secretary of State of the United States to know your name. That's right. But Basil was um, such a big shot that when the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger was actually still living. He's 100 years old. Henry Kissinger still alive. Uh, just turned, he just turned 100 um, a couple weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Henry Kissinger sent the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agencies down to Jamaica to get him back to the U.S. courts to stand charges. So when they get there, they basically try to arrest him. Mm -hmm. And again, we just some parts we're going to really save for the doc. But basically, they tried to arrest him. Believe it or not, the government officials lied to the Jamaican officials and New Basel saying, we're really here representing the Bohemian government. We're not going to take you back to America. We need you to go back to the Bahamas. We're going to sort out our problems with you mm-hmm. in the Bahamas. Right. Right. So Basil, suspecting that these people speak with forked tongue and the line, he says, okay, well, I'll charter my own plane for me and my family back to the Bahamas, but I'm not getting on a plane with you guys. Right. And they play through their little charade. So he thinks he's going to the airport. Again, it seems like it was like a car convoy. So he thinks he's going to the airport to get on his own private chartered plane back to the Bahamas. They got their own plane waiting at the airport. Um, When they're at the airport, according to the article, there's a big commotion because he realizes that um, they're about to pull the double cross and they're about to try to get him on their plane and get them back to the states Mm -hmm. there's a commotion at the airport the jamaican authorities are like hold on what are you americans down here trying to do and uh, it's straight out of hollywood and basically they just bum rush them get them through jamaican security get them on a plane next thing he's in uh miami being arraigned and they drug them like that yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They hit him. They hit him with somebody. I guess, despite of that, he realized 
Um, and again, I don't want to go into too much of it because I want to say something with, you know, right, 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 right. for the doc. Yeah. But yeah, just the fact that the Secretary of State of the United States would be so aware of this guy's activities and at the level mm-hmm. he was operating mm-hmm. that he would get involved just gives you guys a clue. Because let me, let me say that um, who was Secretary of State during um, Big Meech's time, uh, either Condoleezza Rice or Colin Powell. I assure you, Condoleezza Rice or Colin Powell did not know who Big Meech was. I would, I would <laughs> say your money's safe. There. Okay. <laughs> so that's telling you the kind of level. Uh, Kissinger was president when Eddie Jack was Secretary of State when Eddie Jackson was at his height. Yeah. I do not think that Henry Kissinger knew who Eddie Jackson was. No. No. Uh, Eric, Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State when Frank Matthews was at his height. I don't think Henry Kissinger knew who. No. No. I, no. Right? No. Because to give you an example of that, Jimmy Carter, which leads to Nikki Bond's demise, mm-hmm. Jimmy Carter and the Carter administration didn't know who Nikki Bonds was. Mm-hmm. Are we good on all the cameras? Let me let me check. Yeah. Um, until he does that infamous um, New Yorker magazine cover mm-hmm. shot, mm-hmm. and the, where the fame caption is "Mr. Untouchable," and unfortunately for Nikki, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> President Carter read the article. And went then to the Justice Department and said, you guys know who this Leroy Barnes is that guy, heroin dealer in Harlem? Uh-huh. And, the, the, of course, the Justice Department knew who Nikki was and Frank Matthews was and Eddie Jackson, all those guys were. But the President and the Secretary of State, those kind of people, it don't make it that high up the food mm-hmm. chain. That these niggas is out in the street moving that bag, getting all kind of work, right? And um, it was when President Carter read that article about Nikki Barnes, Mr. Untouchable, that he then released the full power of the federal government and said, um, "This we can't have this. This guy's on the cover of the New Yorker magazine calling himself Mr. Untouchable. He's got to be put in jail. That's right. right. You guys need to build a case on him and put him in jail because he's making a mockery of you guys. And um, so... Henry Kissinger didn't know who Eddie Jackson was. Henry Kissinger didn't know who Frank Matthews was. Henry Kissinger didn't know who Nicky Barnes was. But Henry Kissinger knew who Basil Miller, who Basil Miller was. Yeah, he had some serious international ties too. And yeah, man, not to get too deep into it. But yeah, but no, he was. Um, he truly was a big fella, big fella. Uh, no question. You know, and. Um, I guess it's best that I didn't know when I was down there meeting him that I knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew he was that guy. Right. I mean, I just didn't. And I don't even know what Pops, I mean, Pops knew because, um, again, you know, back in the the joke was where we were both locked up in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The only one, the only black guys the Italians talked to basically were Basil and my Pop. Right. And it was obviously something this guy from the islands was that familiar with the Gambino crime family. And that the upper echelons of American organized crime knew who this man was. Yeah, okay. Um, but no, by nineteen, by the time um, seventy four comes, and of course, really, you guys are really going to enjoy that in, in Motown Mafia Reloaded because the parallel timelines that as the Eddie Jackson organization was beginning to ascend and dominate Detroit. There was another story going on down in the Bahamas with this guy, Basil Miller, that was doing some things in this game or the world or the underworld that were really next level. And then as the smallness of the world, that Bahamas situation and the Detroit situation get married in the mid 80s and late 80s when Pops gets out of jail and Basil gets out of jail after meeting up in Atlanta and um, the smallest of the world and of course it's when I have my problems with the DEA going to see Basil that I no longer can go to the islands which leads Basil tells me to go to New York in the future because he's got some bankers in New York 
If you guys go back in the archives, we got a lot of footage when we talking about the money laundering. It was because we were dealing with a guy at this level and we would have to get him his bread, but he was dealing with all kind of bankers and stockbrokers, just shit that we don't be doing back here at home on the block. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, he took a liking to me and he said, uh, I still want you to give me my money, but you can't come back to the Bahamas because you just got pulled off the plane by the DEA and you're compromised now. And then, of course, that's what led me going to New York, and that's how I ended up meeting Money Walt. <laughs> and uh, Brother Jimmy at Columbia was there, and just life full circle, man. Life full circle. But yeah, that that really blew my mind. That was a that was a, a we we got a lot of tidbits of that we didn't know about. Ooh, that yeah. situation in yeah, the it's, it's some stuff we really can't divulge right now. That, my head is still in my lap over that. Like for you're real. just like world small, but. Um, a teaser, yeah. Well, let's do it again one day. Yeah, yeah, buddy. <laughs> let's do it again one day. Um, and last little thing, um, I was wearing a t-shirt the other day. Okay. About Hustler. They, they said oh, Hustler. man, yeah. All right, we'll take a picture of it so you guys can do it. And anyway, in, in this t-shirt I was wearing, just a very nice t-shirt, which comes from our sponsor. Shout out to Vano and Vano's Apparel, located on Davidson between Dexter and Linwood. Vano's Apparel, uh, one of Detroit's premier boutique for men and women. Shout out to the home team. Just talked to Vano uh, yesterday. So yeah, if you guys, and he's got his place blazing hookah. Blazing hookah. All your hookah right. needs. Great place to rent out also for a small party um, right there on Davidson. Um, Great guy, great family. Shout out to Kayla, shout out to Bow Wow, shout out to the whole Vinos team mm -hmm. over there. Um, so I got that shirt, the Hustlers t-shirt from Vino. And it's just a shirt and it just says Hustler and then it has some attributes to being a hustler. and Energetic, strategic thinking, self-starter, um, highly motivated, those kind of things, right? But what it did not say was anything to do with crime. That's right. And it just made us have a conversation off camera that somehow lately or recently, the term hustler became associated with, with criminality. Uh, criminality. And I get where the term gangster and criminality go together, right? That's right, yeah. Gangland activity, gangster. Right. But, you know, just... And my thought, you know, all gangsters are not hustlers, and, and definitely most hustlers are not gangsters. That's right. Most people I think are hustlers don't even involve themselves in narcotics or right. criminality of any of any form. Right. You know, hustler is the guy who cut your hair on Monday, fix your toilet on Wednesday, mm -hmm. cut your grass on Friday. That's right. Right? And does barbecue. And then you can call on Thursday for a plate. That's right. He a hustler. He, he just hustler. He just right. he get it. He get in where he fit in. There there's no job too big, no job too small. That's right. When you call, you know, he, he is that network or she is that networking woman. You can call her about anything. You need a bundle of hair, call her. That's you right. need your hair did. Call her. Yeah. You know what I mean? She might have a vacuum and cleaning equipment in her back. She come to your house and clean your car. Then she also can clean your house. There you go. Then she can also make you a plate. Yeah, she might have an ounce of weed too if you need that too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, a couple of pills if you. Might a couple of pills if, if that's how you feel right, about right, that. Right, 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 right. It don't matter. You yeah. know what I mean? She she do what she need to do. She do what she need to do to, to make it happen and. Um, she might have a couple of Puerto Rican girls that's just dying to meet. Got some friend, matter of fact, and she's a hustler. Cousin, if the Puerto Rican girl don't show up, she'll show up. So she going to, you know, don't matter. That's right. right. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she bought her business. She bought her business. It don't that's matter. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, and, and I think we need to redefine that in our culture. I, I agree. And and get the um um because a lot of people who I know are involved in criminality, they're not hustlers to be honest. Right. If they couldn't make money selling dope, they wouldn't make they wouldn't be able to make no money. Why as a hustler, he might make money selling dope, but if he didn't have a bag, 
he still figured out a way. He still make some money. So I, I always consider myself a hustler, not a gangster, not a tough guy, ah. any of that. Yeah. My activity in that, working with pops, running around with my friends, I was trying to make some money, man. Yeah. It wasn't, I ain't, you know, the bag was a way, it was something to hustle. There's a line in, um, Paid in full, the guy who plays uh, Rich Porter, uh, what's the man name? Michelle Fife. What's the, the actor name? Oh, 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 yeah, Makai Fife. Makai Pfeiffer. Great, shout out to him, great role, of course, he kills that part. Yes, Rich he does. Porter and Paid in Full. But it's a line in, in Paid in Full when he say, you know, basically I'm a hustler. Anything they feeling, I can move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always, I love that line because. Whether it's a bundle, whether it's some Air Force Ones, whether it's a bundle of hair, coffee. whether it's some coffee, whether it's a book. That's right. If the public out there feeling it, your man gonna try to figure out a way to get in where he fit in. <laughs> I'm a hustler, baby. I can sell water to, to a whale. To a whale, you know what I'm saying? I was, that's, I, I, it, it's never that deep or personal. I think that entrepreneurial spirit of hustle attitude, we need to salute that. But I think sometimes it gets hard to salute that because people be like, he hustling, he doing something wrong. Right. Just right. the opposite, actually. Yeah. So salute out to all the hustlers out there. No shade on my gangster family and friends. Got plenty of them too. Sometimes if hustlers are doing that, you have to delve into the gangster world. But those are two different worlds. The hustler world. world. To the hustler world and the gangster world are two different worlds. And the smart hustlers really try to spend as little time in the gangster world as necessary. That's right. But you know, like they, they all got roles. Everybody, everybody got, got a, role. a role to play. And if you a gangster, you really prefer dealing with hustlers to dealing with other gangsters. Because the hustler's motive is pure. He want bread. That's right. You know, gangsters come with a whole lot of extra shit. Mm. They can bring a lot of extra shit to the game, man. Uh, the hustler, you know, oh, they want, he want his bread. He don't want to bother you. He don't want to hurt you. He don't want to get hurt. He That's just right. want his bread. And he want to keep it moving. So, you know, the gangsters, man, you know, now he don't want to pay. He want to take it from you, you know. It just be a lot with gangsters, man. That reminds me of that. I can't remember which movie it was, but it was a film. Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, woman at the at the bar one of the old 70s movies and then she gets smacked up by the uh the guy she with uh -huh. and then uh this is guy just drinking his drink observing it and then he looked at the chick and he said you got a gangster what you need is a pimp <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 what or the, the light out of uh the mac Oh yeah. When the Mac, when he, uh, when he tell the boy, he say, you know, we can handle this like gentlemen, oh, but we can get into some, some gangster, gangster shit. shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So yeah, shout out to all the hustlers out there. We need to we need to again salute and uplift the hustler entrepreneurial spirit in our community. We need to again, some hustlers do get involved in criminality, but that ain't what make you a hustler. Breaking no, the law. No. It's an attitude. No. It's a it's a willing to do what needs to be done. It's it's again it's that attitude that no dollar too big or no dollar too small because my job as a hustler is to get them dollars. That's right, making a dollar out of fifteen cents. For real and all that. So um good show. I guess you got you still got a little bit of your um, Caribbean glow. Hey man. <laughs> Tell you, I can't wait to get back down that way. Man. Yeah, we got to. I mean, it's gonna. And, it, um, and, and it's so much more to. It's so much more to film down there. Oh man, and just you know, um, it had been you know, um, thirty years plus since I've been down there. Yeah. And um, yeah. you know, the life is God is good. Um, the ability to take Miss Miller out to to lunch, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I was reminiscing in my early twenties, you know, when I would go down there, I'd stay at her house. And she was a classy, warm, hospitable woman. Very then. much so. And she's a classy, warm, hospitable woman now. Absolutely. Um, and, and you know those small, again, little perks of this this work we do. Mm -hmm. That you you know because if you'd have told me 15 years ago, you know, if you'd have told me in um, 2011 or when we started this or 2010 or 09 that you know, man. In 2023, you and Lou and we 
we're talking about we're gonna make a movie and and your grandma's damn if you just said yeah and you know in this journey y'all gonna end up back down in the bahamas and you're gonna be with basil's grandson and you're gonna be taking basil's wife um to lunch right you know and, and and talking to some 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 real ones down there oh the crew down there is, is live as it get the crew so live that that's why we ain't got them on camera right the crew is the crew yeah, they, they the crew for real <laughs> <laughs> and they synced it yeah they lived it they lived it. they know they know so i will though classic line with it. My man Gabe down there. Oh brother. God, we gotta make a t-shirt. My dude. man, we, we, we kicking it with brother-in-law and brother-in-law just kicking his game and he said, you know, we had to tell him, we don't take losses, we take lives. <laughs> He's gangster. Oh, true. He's a gangster that hustle. True. Homies say, we don't take losses, we take lives. And, and uh, he did put us up on an uh, excellent documentary, if any of you have Yeah, because it's very similar, it. similarly situated. Absolutely. It's called On the Wings of Men, and you can check that out on uh, Amazon Prime. Please check it out if you can, On the Wings of Men, because... Um, It'll really set you up and give you some understanding of where we're going with this thing and with some of the stuff that we're going to be covering and um, Motown Mafia Reloaded. So um, For sure. So it's good to be back at it, man. Episode 65. The grind 65, man. The grind continues. We have to think of something continues. big to do when we hit the, the 100 mark. Oh, wait. The channel continues to grow. So again, appreciate all you guys' love and support out there. Um, shout out to the whole team. Um... And to quote uh, Puff Daddy, won't stop, can't stop. That's right. So, um, it's your man, Big Lou. Got anything else? No, that's about it, man. Big Lou. Get me, get, get, get at me at uh, Flyers Plus Graphics. Anybody need some graphic design, some video work, uh, I do it all. Hit me up. I'll have my man over there. Um, yeah, man. So it's Motown Mafia Podcast. Of course, a Big Boss Filmworks production. Big Lou Stevens to the left. CRB Jr. on the mic. Appreciate you guys. Love you. I'll let you, man. Peace. Peace. Hit like, share, and subscribe. We out. And that notification bell. <laughs> good work, brother. Good, good work. Good to be back. Good to be back. Good work. Good work. Good work.